This is uh, an image that you may have seen this year. This 2019 is the first year that we lost a glacier in the world. Um, and this is quite a poignant image to me because uh, I was actually born in 1986. And I was born into a family that really values uh, the outdoors. My dad is a super keen skier. Uh, and I grew up basically kind of learning to ski at the same time as learning to walk. And the mountains and the kind of snow have been a massive part of my life uh, and inspired me to kind of live a more outdoors life. Um, and that's something that my dad in particular has been really, really passionate about. So when I saw this image um, this year, I was kind of sad because this is a kind of environment and a space that I'd like to, uh, to protect selfishly, because I love skiing, but also because of the environment that, you know, that kind of uh, weather and that kind of experience affords the uh, wildlife and the lifestyle that we as humans, but also ecology, um, can live. Uh, it's doubly poignant um, because I'm really interested to see what's going to happen in 2052. Why? Because I'm going to have a baby in November, and in 2052, that baby will be 33, hopefully, if it makes it. Well, it's first time mum, I don't really know what I'm doing, but hopefully my baby will make it to 33. And I'm wondering what kind of world um, that person, he or she, will live in. Um, when, I, when I started my career, I worked in international development, and about eight years ago, I was living in Ghana and I was watching TV with the family that I was with. And there was a picture of mountains and snow, kind of snowscape. And I said to one of the kids I was with, do you know what that white stuff is? And he said, well, yes, it's white sand. I said, no, no, it's actually snow. It's called snow. He'd never seen snow. He probably never will. Um, so I tried to explain to him what snow was all about because I love it. I couldn't. It was really hard to explain. Um, so I tried to make some in the freezer. That was not possible. Um, and actually, I realized that you can't very easily or at all uh, convey the kind of feeling that seeing something that makes you really passionate, um, how it makes you feel. So that feeling of when you open the window and it snowed overnight, especially when you're a kid, it's super exciting. I still get super excited by that. But you can't show somebody that without actually them experiencing it themselves. And so I'm really interested to see if things carry on the way they are, what 2052 will look like, particularly in a, in a warmer climate, how will, how will we explain these things that we've lost, basically, because this won't be the last glacier um, that goes. Elsewhere, on a, on a more global scale, technology affords the opportunity for huge data collection. We've obviously heard about that quite a bit today, but there are still places in the world, in lower income places in particular, um, where it's not possible for countries to truly understand what their infant mortality rate is. So this visual here shows you where some of the highest rates of infant mortality exist, where they exist. And one of the reasons they exist, uh, amongst many other things, but is because of the lack of timely data uh, and accurate data. And yet the technology to get that data exists. It just doesn't exist in these places. And actually, I think that's unacceptable. If the technology can work in that way, if other countries are using data to understand how to make their populations healthier, why can't it exist in these countries that really need that information and who could actually make some more value judgments on how to improve their healthcare system, for example, um, to provide better infant mortality rate. This shouldn't really still exist, uh, in my opinion, in today's world. A little bit closer to home, uh, we've talked a bit about poverty today. Uh, in 1999, the UK government committed in 2020 to eliminate poverty in the UK. That's next year. You won't be surprised to know that we're not going to achieve that. Uh, from 2013 to 2017, the use of food banks has doubled, unfortunately. Um, sorry, I should have said in 1919 it was to eradicate child poverty by 2020. Um, but the number of children and pensioners in poverty has actually increased between 2017 and 2018. One in three children are now living in poverty in the UK. And 2.5 are living in food insecure households. And again, I don't think that that should be the case, particularly in this country, um, where we have the means to be able to ensure that everybody has a fair chance. Um, the technology exists to actually help us find solutions but it's not, we're not um, kind of focusing on those sectors enough, in my opinion, particularly when you see 
the fastest growing parts of the market. They're not in these spaces um, whatsoever, really. What's actually really exciting on a more positive note is that two thirds of the children born in 2012 onwards will live to see 100 years old. That's awesome. That's a result of better healthcare, different lifestyles, better way of living. Um, but actually, unless we change the way our society works, we won't be able to support the ageing population that we have. We already are seeing that. Um, and so we radically need to do things quite differently. So in this world where complex and social challenges exist and inequality persists, um, we're really interested at Dot Project to know where does the role of technology fit here? Because we believe that technology can be an enabler in improving lives, in creating better equality, more cohesive communities, um, and reducing inequality. And we believe it because we're part of the solution, we believe. We're working with these communities that are most in need, and we're working with organisations that are working with those communities. But we know it's going to take collaborative action. There's a worrying trend in the tech sector that actually the sector itself is perpetuating poverty divides and enabling division and inequality. And we don't think that should be the case in today's world. We see a different future that requires ambition, passion, and commitment to change. And in kind of thinking about preparing for today, I wanted to kind of either sow a seed, I'm sure I won't have to sow seeds in the audience of today, or just water the seeds that you might already have in terms of how can we make more positive impact in the world. I was looking for a quote from somebody more inspiring than, than me. Um, and I found one in the environment sector from somebody we'll probably all know, um, Greta Thunberg. And I think this is a really relevant quote to the technology sector as well. Um, because what she's saying, and what I believe in the tech sector, is that it's still not too late to act. It will take far-reaching vision, courage, and fierce determination to lay the foundations. And we might not know what the future looks like. We don't know all the details about how to shape the ceiling. It will take cathedral thinking to make the required changes possible. But the thing is that it's definitely possible, but it needs action. And at DOT Project, we are people of action. So we see the big picture, but we also know that change happens in small steps. And the most important factor for creating that change is not the technology solution, it's the people who are involved in change. And they're not just involved in tech, they're involved in many aspects of society, in understanding the problems that we face, in being involved in discourse and communication, and in understanding how solutions, including tech solutions, can create positive change. And we've seen this, so uh, my background is in international development. Uh, I used to work in kind of conflict and fragile zones, supporting people particularly with healthcare. And in the Central African Republic, I've seen firsthand how processes that are life-saving can change as a result of really simple technology. So in the north of the country, what was happening was that in order to prevent uh, measles outbreaks, which was deadly, and meningitis outbreaks, uh, what was happening was that health um, centres were collecting data on paper, and then every week they would put that data onto a plane, and that plane would come back to the capital where somebody would go through that data on paper and figure out if there was a trend emerging to, to see if there was going to be a measles outbreak or a meningitis outbreak. So you're always basically working with a one-week or two-week delay. And when there's an outbreak, you don't have one or two weeks. You have hours, basically, to respond. And so within this country, what we started to do was to actually use mobile phone technology with apps that already existed um, that were really simple, basically, essentially based on text message and data input into databases, which allowed us to reduce the amount of time it took to identify um, outbreaks. And we saw it firsthand. So the first one that happened when we had the system in place, we were able to react within 24 hours and lives were definitely saved as a result. Some people did die, children, um, but not as many as who would have if we didn't have that um, process in place. And what we've seen time and time again is that it's usually the most simple tech solution that works the best. It's not something flashy. It's not something necessarily super expensive. It's the intervention that is focused on solving the root of the problem, not on the functionality of the, the technology itself. 
And that kind of piece about using technology that already exists couldn't be more true today. The examples that I've just given you from a kind of global scale, they were from kind of five or six years ago. And you see how many apps now exist. Technology has just proliferated, which is brilliant for our sector, um, because actually nine times out of 10, what you want to achieve has already been developed in some shape or form. The government doesn't talk enough about the fact that actually a lot of vital services that we take for granted are often being run by charities themselves. Cancer research is a really good example of a charity that has really kind of step change what we know and understand about the treatment of cancer. And w we wouldn't be where we are today in terms of what we understand about cancer if it wasn't for that organisation, which is a, a, a charity. We believe that the work that charities do and the social sector do, does can thrive through the use of technology. But unfortunately, this sector is lagging behind in terms of their digital confidence and their capability to actually understand technology. They're grappling with decreasing funding, which is only going to get worse, shortage of tech talent because they can't pay the wages that the technology sector offers. So people that are talented in, in the tech space are probably going to choose a better paid job unless they're really driven by the purpose of the, the charity itself. But also they lack the confidence, sometimes because they've been burnt in the past by working with an unethical tech partner who's taken a lot of their money and actually the tech isn't working for, their any, for them anymore. Or it might be that they invested in tech five years ago and their organisation has changed now and they need something different, but they don't know what to do because actually they feel like investing in tech is a one-stop shop and once you've done it, you can move on. But actually, we all know that tech changes very rapidly. These organisations that I'm talking about in the social sector, they're capable, very capable, um, of very specific things, very hard things, actually, like engaging with communities, understanding the root causes of complex social problems. You'd be surprised how many people assume what the cause of a social problem might be, only to find that actually it's nothing to do with what's on the surface. It's actually understanding people's behaviour in a, in a really deep way. And social sector organisations are really, really good at that. Some of them have a vast amount of experience about understanding communities and people. They've got over 100 years of being in existence. Uh, and so their experience is really, really valuable. And they really do have a vital role in our society. And the technology sector can help them to thrive um, by supporting them to choose the most responsible tech uh, and also helping them um, to manage that technology in a, in a long-term way. So not just giving them a piece of tech and saying, get on with it, but supporting them through that journey. This is really something I'm quite passionate, what I'm about to say. The value of the technology that these organizations use is not measured by the number of users that use that technology. I'm just gonna go on a slight tangent, and my colleagues at the back end are laugh, because I say this all the time, um, but the technology sector is one of the only sectors that seems to have borrowed the language from the way we talk about addiction and just folded it in to the way that we talk about tech. So we talk about users in the same way that we talk about addiction, and people that use alcohol and drugs. I don't think that's an appropriate or responsible way to talk about technology. Why would we build technology to be addictive? Um, and so actually, in the social sector space, the value of technology is measured in a kind of, in a very kind of global way in the number of lives which are po positively imp impacted in the way that we use technology. And that impact could be um, really, really small within an individual, or it could be bigger within a community or national in terms of how people are affected positively by the way that technology is used. So my challenge would, to you would be, and we think about ways in which we talk about technology, which speaks to its true value and not just the click rate or the users um, that we can measure very easily in numbers. So for us, creating a digitally strong social sector is about building relationships um, between the social and the tech sector. Historically, the tech sector has been driven by a bigger and better attitude. Um, this has led to a disregard for social responsibility, in my opinion. Uh, some organizations are better at social responsibility than others, but generally, there's a disregard for it. And we're now seeing the negative impact of that. It's also a very transactional sector. It's about money, it's about users, it's about how engaged people are. 
Whereas the social sector is built on establishing relationships. It has to be because it's about improving people's lives. And people are people, they're humans at the end of the day. You need a human connection. It's about placing empathy at the center of the activities that take place. And I would argue that there is an overwhelming lack of empathy in the tech sector. Some organizations are very good at it, but it's nine times out of 10 not central to what a lot of tech companies are doing. But actually, if you put empathy at the center of what you do in tech, you could radically change the output that you get from the technology you use. So bringing these two worlds together for us starts with relationships and partnerships and collaboration to go back to what Rich was talking about at the beginning of the today. Each sector has its own language, its own culture and ways of working. Uh, and for example, we often see the social sector struggling to understand what their tech partner is doing. Social sector organizations tend to work on a five-year budget cycle. They're asked to give very specific project plans. They're asked to estimate how many people they're going to help. And the tech sector is like the polar opposite of that. People work in sprints, which sound really fast and kind of a little bit aggressive sometimes. I would love to meet a tech agency that's worked on a five-year budget cycle. I've yet to meet one, which is not how we operate. Um, tech organizations tend to be much more fluid. And this is a huge culture change for the social sector. I believe they need to work more in that way, in a more fluid way, but it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and actually, a lot of the organizations that we work with, the main thing they're struggling with is the relationship with their tech partner, because it just feels like they're moving in opposite directions and almost kind of moving away from each other. Um, so we're quite passionate about the cooperative sector, and we believe that there's a lot that the tech sector and the social sector can learn from the way that cooperatives work. So cooperatives are built on shared values, which speak to equality, ethical values, and social responsibility. And a great example, if you've not heard of the platform co-op movement, really encourage you to look into it a bit more. We've just finished some work with Co-ops UK to do a roadshow to basically help people understand what platform co-ops are all about. And they are essentially an alternative to the likes of Uber, Amazon and Spotify, where wealth and power is more equally distribu distributed. So they're we're talking about digital platforms that are owned in a cooperative way, not owned by shareholders, not owned by one organization, but owned by the people that actually use the platforms. And therefore, those people who are members of that platform have a say in how that platform develops in a more ethical way. And essentially, it's an example of how our tech can be governed and owned in a different way. So what we'd love you to go away from today thinking about is imagining partnerships between social sector organizations and tech partners, where partnerships are based on a core set of values, which champion collaboration, provide an equal voice for everyone involved, and are driven by a responsibility to the people who will ultimately benefit from the technology intervention. It's all right to say that it's really important to speak to your users, um, but actually those people need to be involved and be treated like equal partners, essentially, in the way that technology is developed. Uh, locally, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we're doing proactively in the Southwest. You may have heard of the Tech for Good Southwest movement. Um, we believe in contributing to a, so a stronger ecosystem, and this is part of our social responsibility. So as DOT Project, um, we run, uh, we support the running of the Tech for Good Southwest movement, and my colleague Annie at the back um, is one of the co-organizers. Um, and this is a network across Bath and Bristol, which has uh, just over 800 members at the moment. Um, and it brings together charities and the social sector with tech experts who are keen to contribute to social change. Um, we've got an event coming up on the 25th of September. Uh, they're free to attend. Uh, and it's basically all, all about building a network and a community that can support each other. So through this network, we've been able to help organizations that otherwise wouldn't have been able to progress on their digital journey. So we've supported local libraries to set up um, uh, computers and tech networks within their libraries um, through the pro bono support of the network. We found equipment for charities who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford it. You would not believe the amount of organizations who are using such outdated uh, equipment that means they can't actually use some of the better systems that are in place now that would save them money, essentially. They just can't afford to buy the newer computers. But businesses in the area are getting rid of those types of equipment, and we're able to basically be the matching service 
So if you're interested in tech and you have a tech skill, we would love you to come along to this um, and support the social sector um, because it might be only an hour of your time that you need to give, but it will make a huge difference to these organisations. Um, so we believe, just finally, that it's really important to understand the ecosystem you operate in. The chances are that the people or organisations are having similar ideas to you. Uh, and imagine a world where you can build on what already exists rather than duplicate similar solutions. Because although there are that many apps that exist in the world today, actually each app uh, loses about 77% of its daily active users in about three days. And 57% of downloaded apps are deleted within 30 days. To me, that doesn't look like a sustainable future for some of these solutions. And actually for us, the change is about creating lasting solutions, sustainable solutions for people, and whether that's through an app, through a website, through nothing digital at all, that's where the focus needs to be. So we'd really like to consider reframing the way that we think about technology. Don't start by asking what does it do, but focus on what does it solve and really understand what it could solve. So my challenge to the conversation about the iPod uh, um, example earlier, that people want the flashiest design and the sleekest design, my prediction is that the next generation is not going to care about that because they are being influenced by what's happening in the world right now and the world is seemingly kind of crumbling around them, literally, uh, from a, an environmental perspective. They will be much more conscious of their environmental footprint um, and hopefully value that equally or more than sleek design because what the iPad is the iPod is a brilliant example of how design has just led to more and more infrastructure and products being developed with no real kind of consideration of what that means for the environment. So in closing there's three things that we'd like to ask of you today because everyone has the opportunity to shape this different future. The first is consider if what you want to design already exists. So if you're thinking about developing something new, ask yourself, if, first of all, if it needs to be developed at all. Uh, what problem does it solve? Um, but also, is there a way that you can collaborate with something that already exists and build on that rather than start from the beginning and build from scratch? Second is think about value differently. So are you thinking about the number of users or total investment? Are you kind of driven by the investment figures and going from seed round to seed round and just building up lots and lots of income? Or are you actually interested in how many people are going to be positively impacted? We would really encourage that that is at the forefront and that how you get there is a different journey potentially than going through all of those seed round funding. And then finally, in, in embed respect into your approach, and this kind of goes across every everywhere that we work across technology, often we build things based on assumption and it fails. And I believe that's because there's a lack of respect for the perspectives of people who do not feel comfortable in the technology sector space. And there is so much capability in the social sector who understand these complex problems very, very deeply, who have access to communities who are invisible um, to most of society. And if you can come together on an equal footing and listen um, to what they're saying uh, and shape the kind of solution around the problems that are coming to the table, the likelihood is your solution will be much more successful. So finally, I'm just going to end on a quote from a book called Be More Pirate that my colleague Annie found recently. I think it's really relevant for today. Um, the world doesn't change one person at a time. It changes when networks of relationships form amongst people who share a common cause and vision of what's possible. We don't need to convince large numbers of people to change. Instead, we need to con connect with kindred spirits. And hopefully that's something that the next two days uh, we can do. Um, but yeah, just uh, really encourage you to contribute to this different future that we believe uh, is possible um, and look forward to hopefully having further conversation with you. Thank you.